الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه. First of all, جزاك الله خير. Thank you for the uh, kind introduction. الحمد لله رب العالمين. And uh, the warmth and the informality back there. I told him, I said, you know, he said, I'm going to call you doctor. I said, no, say brother. He said, but I have to live here. They'll be mad at me if I say that. So, <laughs> but uh, your warm spirit, may Allah bless you. Uh, all of the uh, volunteers, uh, the blessing of meeting Abdurrahman, alhamdulillah, and all of the volunteers and all of those that organized uh, this special event. All of you for, for coming, the university. I know that... Um, this was a very short notice. Uh, but for me, honestly, this is very personal. I grew up in the United States of America believing, and this is not flowery language to start something. I honestly felt like I had two home countries. It was Palestine and Bosnia. And subhanAllah, this was something from my childhood. And I'm actually in the process of translating a book of poetry from my mother, uh, May Hashem Suleiman, may Allah have mercy on her. She wrote about Bosnia frequently in her poetry, as much as Palestine. And uh, we had the opportunity to meet Bosnian brothers and sisters in the United States, alhamdulillah, that came in the 1990s in specific. And I always knew two home countries that one day I would want to visit. One of them, alhamdulillah, Allah has made that a possibility today to come to Bosnia. The other one, Palestine, I wait for its liberation, bi'idnillahi ta'ala, to be able to visit that home as well, inshallah. But to be with you all here today is a special, special, special pleasure for me, alhamdulillah. And it's the beautiful thinking of an ummah that even while we might have difficulty expressing language, uh, that others can understand. Sometimes you meet people, and I've had the blessing of being on Hajj many times, and you can see in someone's face that they are your brother, they're your sister. And sometimes the love that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts between us is even when we can't speak to each other, which is very special. Why? Because we read the same Quran because we pray the same way, because we love the same one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, more than we love ourselves, because we love our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The beautiful notions and values of humanity that Allah has put inside of us, mercy that we have for one another, which is not a human phenomenon, but one part of Allah's mercy that we see each other with an eye of mercy, with a lens of compassion. And that is very special about this gathering, alhamdulillah, as it is about everything else. And the fact that actually what brought me here is a tribunal for Kashmir in Bosnia. A Palestinian coming to Bosnia for a tribunal on Kashmir. I think that says it all about the unification and the potential for us truly functioning as that one body that we are told by our Prophet ﷺ to function as one true human body. And so thank you all for making the time on short notice to be here. While tonight I am going to speak very politically, today I'm going to speak within the realm of Teskia, within the realm of spirituality. And I think that often we separate those two worlds to an extreme, but there is always room for our spiritual foundations to be refined so that we can renew our intentions to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to act in a way that is most beloved and most beneficial to ourselves and most pleasing to Him. And so the topic of my lecture, good things or bad things, good people. There's a philosophical part to this, a theological part to this, which is what often comes up when people say, how come good things happen to bad people and bad things happen to good people? That is not the thrust of my discussion tonight. Okay? It's the question of evil, the question of why, you know, this person who is a tyrant, this person who is evil, yet somehow they have access, somehow good things happen to them. 
and then you have another person who lives their lives righteously and bad things happen to them, how is that possible? Because ultimately, the question that we're not asking is what is good and what is bad? We are not capable of encompassing with our limited faculties what is good and what is bad. So I'm going to start with this for a moment. If you spoke to an insect and you asked the insect to explain to you the most complex political issue that's happening in the world right now, can you unravel all of this for me and explain all of this for me? The insect would be incapable and we would not burden ourselves with waiting for an explanation from an insect. Why? Because we understand that the insect is limited in their understanding. Okay, let's graduate to a human being. You don't walk up to a baby and ask the baby to explain to you complex phenomenon. Because you can see, even though you were once that baby, you can see that the understanding of that baby is limited by their infancy. When we compare the knowledge that we have and what we can encompass with our understanding and our faculties of the world around us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the discrepancy is far greater than us to that child or a human being to even the smallest insect. And that's something, by the way, that Allah has given us signs, signs around us so that we could understand our limitations. You know, Allah has given us, جَعَلَ لَكُمُ السَّمْعُ وَالْأَبْصَارُ وَالْأَفْئِدَةِ Allah mentions faculties. He gave you your hearing, He gave you your seeing, He gave you your sense of comprehension, perception, so that you could get to know Him. We will show them signs in our furthest arrangements. In the furthest arrangements in the sky, as well as in themselves, until they come to the understanding that this is the truth. So Allah has given us enough to understand that we really don't know much. How? If you were to compare the size of the earth to the observable elements around the earth, you realize we're really not that big. How much have we seen that lets us know? SubhanAllah, even the effect, the light, billions of years after from a star that lets us know our limitations constantly. But it also lets us know that as much as you can see, there is so much more that you can't see. And so that is to dawn upon you your limitations, your limitations. Someone asked me the question. I said this wasn't going to be the bulk of my talk. But like you said, we, we talk a lot, you know professors and, and, and doctors, and especially mashayikh. Not your mashayikh in Bosnia, just the ones in America. We talk too much. Um, you know, I, I was asked this question recently about the hadith of a mother and her child, where the Prophet ﷺ said that Allah is more merciful to you. Arhamu bikum. Allah is more merciful to you than a mother is with her child. And someone said, but a mother would never do this to her child. And I said, do what? Right? And what are you speaking about? Because you're reading what a mother does to her child from the capacity of now understanding at the level of the mother the nature of the child. Let me put it to you this way, okay? How many of you have been babies before? You are all children before, right? We don't remember when we were one year old. We don't remember when we were, you know, you might have some bits and pieces that flash through your mind from when you were two year old. But when your mother took something away from you, when you were a one year old, you were trying to choke yourself. All right. I have a two year old, so I get this. The look that she gives me, you know, my, my, my baby Khadija, she has a, uh, we play Barbies together. I play Barbies with her. So she takes the she takes this little piece. She broke it off, and I don't know. She loves the Barbie, but then she rips the head off of the Barbie and rips the arms off sometimes. And then you have to get her a new Barbie, and she's trying to choke on this little piece. And I take it out of her mouth, and she gives me this look like I am the greatest tyrant in the world. 
I'm the biggest zalim in the world. Like, how dare you? I thought you loved me. How dare you take this toy away from me? Because that's the nature of her understanding. Now, when Khadija grows up, inshallah, and she sees another baby, maybe her own, which I can't think about right now, but another baby, she'll perfectly be able to understand that because she will be at the level of the giver and the taker at that point, not the one who's being taken from. The one who's being taken from, it's not that you have to come to terms with what's being taken and what's being given. It's the level of understanding of the one from whom being taken is actually giving them life because you're not allowing that child to choke themselves to death. It's about their faculties, about their understanding. And so all of this is to say what? The discrepancy between the knowledge of Allah and each and every single one of us and the knowledge of a mother and her child is as great as any discrepancy that you can calculate. إِنِّي أَعْلَمُ مَا لَا تَعْلَمُونَ قَالُوا أَتَجْعَلُ فِيهَا مَنْ يُفْسِدُ فِيهَا وَيَسْفِكُ الدِّمَاءَ SubhanAllah, even the angels said, when Allah said, إِنِّي جَاعِلٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ خَلِيفَةً When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala appointed Adam alayhi salam, they said, أَتَجْعَلُ فِيهَا مَنْ يُفْسِدُ فِيهَا وَيَسْفِكُ الدِّمَاءَ Wait, you're going to give this to someone that spills blood and spreads corruption? What did Allah say? Allah did not give them a long philosophical answer. Allah did not say to the malaika, to the angels, well, in this generation, this person will come. And this prophet, and this person. Allah said, I know what you don't know. إِنِّي أَعْلَمُ مَا لَا تَعْلَمُونَ And the angels submit to that. I know what you don't know. And the mufassireen, they they explain that. They say what Allah was talking about is the goodness that will come out of this human enterprise. It's not just corruption. Out of the loins of this Adam, alayhi salam, will come the likes of Isa, alayhi salam, Jesus, peace be upon him, Musa, alayhi salam, Dawood, alayhi salam, Ibrahim, alayhi salam, Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Out of the likes of the loins of this, this creation. But, O oh, Malaika, I don't have to explain all that to you right now. I know what you don't know. So I'm not going to list a justification or bring this to the philosophical capacity of an angel. You have to trust, I know what you don't know. Now all of this can be accepted to most people. But then you know when you can't accept it? When you wanted to marry someone and then something got in the way. And you thought, why is this happening? Or you got married and the person that you thought you were marrying is not the person that you thought you were marrying. Be careful if you nod your head, if your spouse is in the crowd. All right, but the person that you ended up marrying was not the person that you thought that you were marrying. Or you get diagnosed with a difficult health situation. Or your child is hurt by something. Or war and destruction happens. All of these things happen to us on a personal level and it's hard to see perspective through your own pain. You know what's beautiful about that part, by the way? Allah does not expect of you, Allah does not expect of you when you are in pain to speak the rationale, to speak out the rationale of why hard things happen to good people. Let me explain this to you. Sabr, patience, when hardship strikes, is not about what you say, it's about what you don't say. When the Prophet ﷺ was struck with the loss of his son Ibrahim, can I rationalize why the most beloved creation of Allah buried six of his seven children? I can't, but I trust Allah. And so did the one upon whom that happened, the Prophet ﷺ. Can I go through the list? Can I say it would have been better if it was five out of six instead of six out of seven? Or maybe just one child so the Prophet could share in that pain with those that go through that difficulty of losing a child and, you know, what's seemingly an insurmountable difficulty of losing a child. Can I go through like and, and start to list if I use my human calculations and say losing one child would have been enough to expand the empathy of the Prophet? Why Ibrahim all the way at the end? 
Ibrahim died right before the Prophet ﷺ, by the way. Right before him. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Could I say, oh, well, maybe Ibrahim would have grown up without a father. Oh, maybe that's why. Or maybe it would have been too much pressure. Or maybe the people would have killed him because he's the only son of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I can go through those, but it's useless. It is absolutely useless. I'm actually telling you, don't do that. Okay? It would be useless to sit there and list out why this is happening to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And you know who did not list it out? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But when he held Ibrahim, what did he do? What did he do when he held Ibrahim? Did he hold Ibrahim, his dead son, and say, you know my ummah, sometimes bad things happen to good people. And this is why it's happening. And go through a list of things for people to understand? No. You know what the Prophet ﷺ did when he held Ibrahim? He cried. The heart feels sadness. The eyes shed tears. And we are sad over the death of Ibrahim. لكن لا نقول إلا ما يرضي الله. But we're not going to say except that which is pleasing to Allah. We're only going to say Alhamdulillah right now. So it's not that when pain hits you, you have to sit there and rehearse the lines and try to come up with a philosophy as to why this might be better for you. You just have to trust the one in whose hands and whose understanding is what you cannot grasp. One of the scholars of the past, he said that the trust, that the tawakkul that you have, the trust that you have in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is of three levels. There are three levels. I believe it was Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala who said there are three levels of trust that you can have in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said the first one is to trust Allah the way that you trust an agent, a wakil. You know, if you entrust someone with your land or your property, or you tell someone to check the mail while you're gone, or you tell someone, I'm going to pay you to go and carry out this transaction for me, you monitor that person, right? And the minute that that person acts in a way that you feel like you did not commission them to, what do you do? You call them back. And you admonish them, right? You, you criticize them. And you probably replace them as well. If they keep on doing what you don't want them to do. Okay? That's one level of trust because when you hire an agent, you do so with some base level of trust for that person. But not real tawakkul. That's not real trust. But it was enough to make them your wakil and then you replace them. So the second level is the way a child trusts the mom. Now he said, children throw tantrums. They cry and they scream and they shout when you take something away from them. You do it to protect them. You do it to save them. And subhanAllah, one of the things that's really interesting about that relationship between a mother and her child is even when the mother causes the child pain in the, in the child's understanding, the child seeks comfort from the same person, from the mother. All right? So let me play this out for you without crying. I'm not going to cry on stage, okay? But if you, mom, pull something away from the child, child screams and goes, ah! Who does the child try to get a hug from? Mom! So the child puts his or her arms out, and, oh, Zakallah, you're taking the water from me, Shaykh. <laughs> the child puts his or her arms out, and seeks comfort from mom, even though all the child can see is that mom just caused me pain. But still, I know mom loves me in the back of my two-year-old brain. <laughs> Somewhere in there, my emotions, my fitra, my nature tells me no one loves me more than mom. No one can comfort me like mom. So it's not like if I'm in the grocery store, think about it this way, you know, if I'm shopping and then mom takes something away from me, I go to some stranger and say, hug me, pick me up, give me relief. You give me candy now and I'll be your child. You don't do that. You go back to mom. Because there's an elevated level of trust. There's an elevated level of trust. That I trust you enough. That even though I feel like you're causing me pain right now, I know that you also can give me comfort that no one else can give me. With Allah Azza wa Jal, لا ملجأ ولا منجأ منك إلا إليك one of the most powerful du'as of the Prophet ﷺ. La malja'a. 
ولا منجا منك الا اليك لا ملجا ولا منجا منك الا اليك there is no escape and no shelter from you except to you so beautiful there is no escape or shelter from you except back to you that's an elevated level of trust the mother to the child the third level is to trust allah the way that the dead body trusts the washer ghusl and mayit subhanallah ibn al-qayyim rahimahullah says very beautifully that the dead body is turned in whatever direction the washer sees fit in order to purify you and cleanse you and the dead body does not express any objections let's the washer turn and wash and purify as the washer sees fit and that is the greatest level of tawakkul you can have in allah subhanahu wa ta'ala walillahi al-mathal al-a'la and to allah belongs the best example to trust allah that much you trust allah that much now let's say you get past that trust tawakkul is the theological foundation al ihtisab to seek the reward for your moment of pain is the spiritual active way to use your tawakkul al ihtisab uh, the definition of al ihtisab is a sabr li raja al thawab to be patient with the hope of allah's reward so it's not just patience because you're just you know once it's like someone punches you so you just take it no it's a sabr li raja al thawab it's oh allah i'm hurt reward me oh allah i'm in pain so give me of the hereafter oh allah i'm in pain give me paradise that is a sabr that's al ihtisab to seek allah's reward which in arabic a sabr li raja al thawab to be patient for the hope in allah's reward okay so you're seeking a reward now with that pain you're immediately channeling it and you're saying ya allah i'm not going to waste my time asking you why this is happening to me can anyone tell me about a perfect woman who lived under a tyrant what her name was asia the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam mentioned four women who perfected their iman perfect faith I mean that's a an incredible testimony perfect iman perfect okay Maryam alayha salam Khadija radiyallahu ta'ala anha Fatima az-Zahra radiyallahu anha Asiya alayha salam Asiya stands out in her circumstances I mean why do bad things happen to good people the worst person happened to the best person <laughs> Firaun is her husband I mean think about that the best person is married to the worst person the best person in the world at the time is Musa alayhi salam because he's nabiyullah kalimullah Musa alayhi salam but the best non prophet is asia at the time right wallahu alam but i mean perfect woman and i got stuck with this guy <laughs> firaun out of all people where the qadr of allah could have gone you know taken me to like you know sometimes i see a sister it's usually the sister is complaining about their husbands i understand not the husband but like like i like my husband doesn't pray you know here i am i'm trying to become a better muslim my husband doesn't pray My husband does this. My husband does that. Asia married to Firaun. Did Asia ever ask? Yeah, Allah, why? <laughs> why did I have to be in this situation? Couldn't I have been married to like just some other Egyptian man? <laughs> Out of all of them, you decreed Firaun to be my husband. The guy who's known for you dhabihuna abna'akum wa yastahiyuna nisa'akum that guy who's known for killing men 
and humiliating women and he's my husband? None of that discourse comes with Asya. Why? Because, for one, could we really say, now if you lived at the time, but could we really say now, looking back and knowing who she is, Asya would have been Asya without Fir'aun? See the question? Do we know that Asya would have perfected her faith without the test of Fir'aun? We don't know that. We know now, because the Prophet ﷺ told us she's a woman of perfect faith. And what is the one time we hear her voice in the Qur'an? We hear her voice in the Qur'an. It's when she says, as she's being killed, It's incredible. This is her voice in the Qur'an. The one time we hear her speak is at the last moment when Fir'aun is murdering his wife. Murdering his wife in the worst way. You know, this is, this is why he's Fir'aun. This is why he's so evil. You'd think that, you know, Asiya was a, was a woman of great akhlaq. She had showed good character towards him, right? So even if now he knows he's a, she's a believer, right? Like if you're going to kill her, kill her privately, right? What does he do? He lets these strange men, these guards, take her out in public. You know, the, 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 the nature of the execution of Asiya, it's horrible, horrible execution. The humiliation by all these people, your wife. And then take a, take a stone, lash her, and then take a stone and drop it from the top so that it crushes her. His own wife. Where is all the years of, of, of marriage? And That's Fir'aun. That's how hard the heart can become. And that's when we hear her voice. Oh Allah, build for me, with you, a house in paradise. That's ihtisab. Build for me, with you, a house in paradise. By the way, the ulama say, notice that before she asked for Jannah, she asked for Allah. رَبِّ بِنِنِي عِنْدَكَ بَيْتًا فِي الْجَنَّةِ Meaning, replace Fir'aun with you. Replace that palace with a palace in Jannah. It's the ultimate ihtisab. Replace Fir'aun with Allah. عندك. I no longer, I'm no longer عنده. I want to be عندك. I know I'm no longer with him. I want to be with you. And then I no longer, I was pulled out of my palace. Give me a bait in Jannah. Give me a palace in paradise. Before the stone hit the body of Asiya, she already saw her place in Jannah. She started to laugh. And Allah took her soul before the stone hit her body. It's profound. Now, by the way, if you live in the world of Asya and there are cameras and the clip is taken, circulated around the world on Twitter and wherever it is, the execution of the wife of the Pharaoh, 21st century, it might cause you a faith crisis. How could that happen to such a good woman? Where was Allah? Why didn't this happen? Why didn't that happen? How did this happen? How did that happen? Because there's no way for you to know that Allah took her soul before the stone touched her flesh and gave her her palace in Jannah. We know that because we're not reading Twitter, we're reading Qur'an. Seriously. You have an ayah of Qur'an, not a tweet. You have the words of the Prophet ﷺ that represent the incident, not a video. Even the most perfect video, I'm not even talking about a fake video, the most perfect video would not have been able to lend to you the details that make that story a good story now. Now you hear that story and you say, MashaAllah. You praise Allah and you praise the maqam, the station of Asiya alayhi salam. But your eyes in perfect vision would have betrayed you. You wouldn't have been able to get it. But the question becomes, do you think Asiya in her palace in Jannah says, Ya Allah, why did I marry Fir'aun? You think she cares? <laughs> you think she's like, you know, I could have had a nicer dress. I could have had a better life. Or is she pleased? Radiallahu anhum wa radu an. Ahlul Jannah. Allah says the people of paradise. May Allah make us amongst them. 
رضي الله عنهم ورضوا عن Allah is pleased with them and they're pleased with Allah. It's not just that Allah is pleased with them. They're pleased with Allah. They're saying, Ya Allah, what more can there be? Allah says, are you pleased? What's left? Alam tutkhilna jannah Didn't you enter us into paradise? Alam tubayyid wujuhana? You, you lightened our faces. You gave us all this. What's left? And Allah keeps adding more and more and more and more and more and more and more. And more. You say, Radit, Radit. Ya Ahl al Jannah, Raditum, O people of paradise, are you pleased? Yeah, we're pleased. Okay, here's more. The point is, dear brothers and sisters, part of the test of this world is actually, of the greatest of its tests, is the uncertainty of it all. You're in toil constantly, one thing after the other. And the nature of this life, by the way, is when you feel like you've caught a breath, <sighs> next test. It hits you. And again, and again, and again, and again. And then you breathe, and then another one comes. Because when you're in kebet, it's like, you know, imagine a person rolling over, right? You're in kebet. But the point is, you can be the person rolling down the hill, or you can be the body that trusts its washer. Let Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take control of your affairs. Wahtasib. And seek that good from Allah. I want to conclude with two thoughts, inshallah ta'ala, in this regard. One of them is on the individual level, as you are striving, understand that it's much easier to convey to someone else these concepts than to practice them when you're in the middle of it. Allah knows that. You can always comfort someone else and say, you know, in a matter of yusra, with hardship comes ease, don't worry, this or this, you know, feel better, you'll be okay, I promise you. Remind people of the bright side that they're not seeing. It's easier to do that for someone else. But you know, when you're in pain sometimes, those faculties shut. The person in front of you speaking, your ears can't hear them right now. But the thing is, is that Allah gave you these, first and foremost, وَسَعْلَ الْمَعَارِفِ Means of knowing Allah. Listen to the Qur'an. Listen to the words of your Prophet wasallam. Let that be the input when you're in those moments where it's really, really hard to figure out. The last thing in this regard is that even for communities, bad things, good people, the hard times, make us a different type of community. I want you to imagine if the Prophet Sallallahu and the companions never had to make hijrah. Medina would have never been. I want you to imagine an Islam without Medina. Can't imagine it. You can't think of it. What if Uhud never happened? We'd never learn the lessons of Uhud, that we're still learning today. The khandaq, the trench. You know, subhanAllah, as a community, when you go through a hard time together, it builds something amongst you, right? Think about it. Some of your closest friends in the world are going to be people that went through something very difficult with you in life, right? You feel like they were there with you in a very difficult time, and they become the best of your friends. Can you imagine the nature of the relationship of the Prophet ﷺ and his companions that were in the khandaq together, in the trenches together? Facing death. Facing the highest uncertainty. The highest uncertainty. Because khandaq very realistically looked like the end of Medina, the end of Islam, the end of the Prophet ﷺ and his companions. But they came out of that khandaq. They didn't just build a trench, they ended up constructing a world that we still benefit from today. A vision, a mission, a message. And the stories that came out of the khandaq. Salman al-Farisi radiallahu ta'ala anhu would have not been Salman al-Farisi without the trenches. Because the trench was his idea. Salman would have never heard from the mouth of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Salmanu minna ahl al-bayt. Salman is one of me, he's one of us, he's my family. All of that would have been lost. Now when you were in the trench, it would have been very hard to behold that future reality. 
But now we look back and we say, Alhamdulillah for the khandaq. Alhamdulillah for the difficult times of the Prophet ﷺ and his companions. Not that we like, we hate to hear of the pain that our Prophet ﷺ encountered. But we benefit from the lessons, from the dua, from the community, from the construction, from the idea of resilience that was lived by the Prophet ﷺ and his companions. What if they all just accepted the Prophet ﷺ and Safa? He stood up on Safa, called them and they, they said, You are a sadiq al-ameen, nu'minu bik. We all believe in you. Mecca became Muslim right away. Habasha is gone. Medina is gone. The lessons of tests and resilience, the people, the brilliance, the wisdom, the sincerity, all that we gained over the next two decades that 1400 years later still benefit us would not have been there. So we say Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah for the tough times. Alhamdulillah for the times of ease. Alhamdulillah, through the tough times. Alhamdulillah, through the times of ease. Alhamdulillah, da'iman abada. That's it. Alhamdulillah, always. Let Allah wash your soul the way that the dead body is washed by the one who does ghusl for it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect all of you here in Bosnia, protect all of our brothers and sisters around the world. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect you as individuals, preserve you. May the pain that you have faced be nothing but paradise in the hereafter for you. The small trials and the major trials. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow you to be nourished always with faith, with resilience, with knowledge of Him, with steadfastness. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grow us in our love for him and our longing for him. And may Allah allow all of us as we are gathered here to be gathered around our beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Jannat al-Firdaus. Allahumma ameen. Jazakumullahu khayra. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brother Omar, thank you very much for your inspiring words. God bless you and give you the best of all. Amen. Jazakumullahu khayra. But uh, anyway, we have a few questions which came to us for the Zoom. Meanwhile, I, I ask audience if they have any, any, any question to, to prepare them. A microphone is available here and uh, please share, the, share them with, the, with us. Uh, Staz, Staz Omer, the question we, we received through the, through the Zoom is basically, how do we deal with the hardship when we have a sub? but began lacking motivation to move forward and find solutions. Hmm. How do we, so I, if I understand the question, you know, uh, sabr, sometimes you, you have sabr during the hardship, you have patience, but you've lost motivation. That's a very, very significant um, part of it. And it's very real, it's very human. And sometimes, by the way, pausing a bit is not a bad thing. Sometimes to pause a bit is not a bad thing. Uh, you know, not everything that doesn't include moving is bad. I mean, sometimes it's okay to take time to make dua, to disconnect for a little bit, uh, to use the moment to heal. That's all okay sometimes. However, you want to put a limit to how long that's going to be because otherwise you'll you'll stop there and, and you'll really kind of get stuck and you won't be able to move. And so sometimes moving forward, by the way, finding the motivation to move forward is in doing the things that you used to do until the motivation comes back. I give this example of people sometimes, you know, uh, when people are only religious, practicing uh, spiritual in spurts, like, you know, high moments, low moments. We all have high and low, but like some people's high is here and some people's low is here, right? Uh, imagine if people only went to work when they felt like it. I know now we're in a pandemic, so it's like, you're like yeah, it's, you can't Zoom your imam, you know? You only went to work, you only earned when you felt like it, all right? Most people would be broke. They'd be bankrupt. Right? 
Because the idea is you go to work even some days when you don't have motivation because you have to earn. And the way that you do better is by reminding yourself why you're earning and then pursuing higher career opportunities, trying to move up. But there are going to be days, the consistency of going to work. Imagine if you only went to school classes when you felt like it. What would happen to them? A student, they'd be in trouble, right? Now, if, if you're the professor, they'll always come. But it's hard sometimes. You're going to feel a lack of motivation. But the idea is you go and you, and, and you do what you do, even if it's at a minimal level, even if that day you're not going to do too much, but you're still going to go to class, you're still going to take your notes, you're still going to do at least the bare minimum of preparation so that you don't flunk the class, you don't fail in the class. When it comes to our spirituality and motivation, Sometimes the motivation is numb for a moment. You know, when, when you get hit, uh, if you get hit in the same spot multiple times, you get numbed, right? So sometimes there's a numbness, but you keep on doing the bare minimum until the feeling comes back. And you do that by, again, reminding yourself of the importance of doing it, even when you don't have the motivation, as well as the fact that, look, at some point the feeling comes back. As human beings, Allah has created us in, in, in very, very, subhanAllah, special ways, right? But we have immense potential to recover, to be resilient, and to grow as human beings. Allah has given us that. That sometimes you're in the middle of a test and you think, no way I'm ever going to get past this. I will never survive this test. And you do. Not because of who you are, but because of the one who created you the way that you are. So that would be my long answer to a short question. Thank you very much. Uh, any more questions from the crowd, please? Do we, can we have a microphone over there? Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. First, I really want to thank you for your great speech. Uh, my question is, uh, let's say if you're two-year-old and our mom or whoever is taking that thing that's dangerous for us, how should we know uh, if that is really why that's getting away from us and uh, how can we um, be assured that that's something that we are not supposed to chase after or, uh, or is it something that we should say, okay, that's like, that's not good for us, we should let it go or should we say, okay, that's good for us, for us but it's a test and we should keep fighting, how can we differentiate between those two? Um, I'm always very like hesitant to answer those questions because the questioner means something. And I'm like, I don't know how specific and how to, how, but I appreciate the question. So I'll give some principles as to how to address maybe in some different scenarios. Um, from what I understand, what you're talking about is at what point do you move on from something worldly, right? and just say that is the qadr of Allah, as opposed to keeping on and, and uh, pursuing it, right? That's the question, right, for the most part. Um, you know, the value of istikhara, and I know that um, istikhara sometimes is prayed and people say, I, I'm going to wait for a dream. It's not the dream. The istikhara is actually, Imam al-Nawi rahimahullah puts it very beautifully. He says that, you do istishara of people, which is seeking people's, you know, people that are knowledgeable, people that are wise, people that are well-wishers. You seek their advice because sometimes when you're in the midst of something, it's very hard for you to maintain like rationale. Like you really want something bad. And so you're really, you're, you're getting emotionally attached to something, whether it's an opportunity or whatever it may be. And you're, you're losing your best reason. And so you have people around you that know you enough to tell you that, okay, at this point, you really should probably move on. It's probably best for you. I think, you know, people that you know are knowledgeable or that know you well enough and you take their nasiha, you take their advice, that's istishara. So Imam al-Nawi rahimahullah says that basically istikhara is building on istishara. You're seeking Allah's counsel. So, oh Allah, if this is good for me, make it happen for me. If it's bad for me, take it away from me. You're now moving it. It's basically a dua we are asking Allah to facilitate the best direction for you. Now when you do istikhara, you don't give up istishara. 
you still keep on letting people advise you, seeking advice from, from people and, and, and trying to make your best decision. And I think that, you know, it, there's no perfect answer to this in the midst of it. But typically, when there are obstacles to something and the people that love you most are saying it's, it's best for you to move on, then it's probably best to move on. Uh, you know, and, and that's something where, um, again, I've seen people give up on things way too quickly. And I've seen th more, more often get attached to, to something for way too long. So it's, it's, it's using your best judgment and seeking Allah's help throughout the process. Thank you for the question. Thank you, Brother Omar. Meanwhile, we got another question for the, for the Zoom, which possibly is not directly related to the topic, but to the, to the question of Palestine and Kashmir, saying, what we as ordinary people can do for fellow brothers, and I would say, and sisters and in Palestine and Kashmir, we need some practical st steps and advisors. Thank you for your advice. So, first of all, I, I don't think that people in, in Bosnia maybe understand how much they mean to the rest of us. When, 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 when the Bosnian people express solidarity with their brothers and sisters in Palestine, it means something. You know, when, when you see solidarity being expressed, uh, as people in Bosnia, I'm sure you can relate to what it has meant to know that the, the, the Muslim world and people around the world, their hearts were with you and to, to hear the khutbahs, to, hear, to see the protests, to see the advocacy in different parts of the world. Other people, when they're going through something, the, the most powerful form of solidarity is when it's from a people that understand what it's like to be vulnerable and oppressed. It's the most powerful form of solidarity. And that provokes and uplifts the, the human spirit in ways that, that not, you, you really cannot understand. And so you talk to people in Gaza, for example. I'm telling you that the people of Gaza will say multiple times that we were nourished by the solidarity that we were seeing around the world. When the bombs were falling, and we knew that the world was with us. We saw your protests, we heard your voice, we knew that you were with us throughout the way. It gave us that added level of motivation sometimes to continue forward. And so the expression of solidarity from one people who have experienced that type of oppression to another people is the most powerful form of expression. And so I want to bring it to that bare minimum first and foremost, that that could be as irrelevant or as small as your social media activism and as your protests in the streets and uh, your writing of articles in the media here to keep the issues of these places alive, right? It graduates, it goes to the next level, the next level, the next level. And I think that uh, in any situation, inshallah ta'ala, when you can then organize that pressure, and in, in a country like this, alhamdulillah, where you, you, you will have leadership that will validate that solidarity, inshallah, to make it such that your leaders, even as you know, the issue of Bosnia in and of itself and things that are happening at the local level rise to the top of priority, that Palestine always remains a priority, that Kashmir remains a priority, that all of these things remain a priority, inshallah ta'ala. You know. See, he's going to be mad. He's going to say, why did you take me off the stage? <laughs> what did I do to you to make... Mashallah. You can let him come. It's okay. He can come. See, he went back oh, to mom. Possibly he, <laughs> possibly he has a question as well. Yeah, maybe he has a question. You, ne you never know. And kids know to, to, to pose bad questions for everyone. Yeah. Right? Okay. Mashallah. In addition what, to what, the... What's his, what's his name? Muhammad. Muhammad. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless him and Muhammad. protect him and make him the coolness of your eyes and make him from the righteous. Amin. Allahumma amin. amin. Okay, any other question from the crowd? Yes. Okay, let us take a few more questions. Thank you, Meho. Assalamu alaikum. Alaykum um, assalam. First of all, I'd like to say that I feel truly privileged and honored to have seen you here today. Um, 
you're what Muslims should be today, like epitome of Muslim activism is, is what I see in your work. And alhamdulillah, I hope we get as many people like you as we can in this world. Well, my question is, is related to the topic. Um, I'm not a conflict type of person, so I really try to evade it as much as I can. But if you are in a situation that you know essentially takes a conflict to be resolved, how long do you wait till you actually engage in that conflict uh, so it doesn't, you know, become too long after you've made your du'as and, and istikhara and all that, and you know you want to get rid of that burden that that situation is causing you? Thank you. Jazakumullah khair. Um, may Allah bless you and uh, see you and all of us through whatever that is, inshallah ta'ala, any of these situations. Often the best way to, um, and, and there is no good way to navigate, or no perfect way to navigate these, these, these types of things. But when we put things off, when, when, when something is inevitable, then it's better to get ahead of it. And to uh, hasten, not the conflict, but when clear-minded, clear-hearted, and can address it in the most productive ways, bring up what needs to be brought up and try to, try to, you know, usually the way out of a big conflict is a small conflict, right? Before it escalates to a big conflict. And so to bring it into the most healthy of times and then have the most healthy ways of addressing it in those moments is usually the best way to put off things when they become much more difficult uh, for us. But that's very hard to do. Um, some people are very conflict averse. They just, they have an aversion to conflict. And so it ends up always coming to them because they put off things and then eventually it's, I'm one of those people, so don't feel bad. You're, you're kind of saying, I, I have, a lot of us have that issue. It's, it's, it's very common for people to have a hard time uh, to have those conversations before they become very difficult conversations. So that is the best way and seek Allah's help and may Allah Azza wa make make uh, whatever is, is needed for, for you and for all of us easy in that regard. Uh, thank you, uh, Ustaz Omar. If I may add, possibly, during my MA, uh, MA studies in Damansara at the International Institute of Islamic Thought in Kuala Lumpur, I learned one, at least I was reminded about one thing from, from one uh, Iranian professor saying, Meaning that for centuries we have had an institute and principle of shura, of, you know, of, of talking to each other and consulting each other in Quran. However, that was his uh, opinion, and I, 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 firmly, I, I firmly agree with him, that for the last uh, uh, 14th century we have not managed to develop practical mechanisms of shura, or in another words of saying, you know, or looking from, uh, from the other perspective, conflict resolution. In that sense, I believe that uh, we need to invest a lot, I would humbly say, to, you know, in, uh, in a sciences, yes. practical sciences, helping us to develop practical, concrete steps and mechanisms of doing shura, yeah. doing consultation, uh, of resolving conflicts. And in that sense, I believe, we should not distance and escape from, for example, of, of, from the help of social scientists, social sciences, psychology, and, and, and their practical, practical knowledge. Uh, uh, thank you for... Yes, for, for, for your question, and sorry for, for, no, you know, if I may for jumping add to in. That very quickly, that there are, you know, in my university now, there is actually a master's program in conflict resolution. Um, and I think that that is a science, it truly is a science. And so uh, maybe the university can, can introduce a program in conflict resolution if it's not already there, inshallah. I mean, it, it is there, but definitely, generally speaking, about how we, how we Muslims contemplate about, you know, certain issues, problems, right. so on, we are facing challenges. Uh, 
is a, a very often in a you know abstract. Yeah. You know, without without systematic uh, systematic solutions. Right. Okay. Uh, it seems we have a few more questions here. I do not know how much of, of time we, we should give to questions. Possibly, let us take a one more question, and, uh, and then we, we have to, to conclude today's session. And that uh, question would be... Okay. This, this sister has had her hand up. Oh, okay, sister. Okay, this sister, please. No problem. I just wanted to say that uh, I have the need to say to tell you that uh, recently I was literally like making duas to Allah to send me someone or something that will remind me to have trust in Allah. Mm -hmm. And especially your first part of the talk when you were talking about losing a child and everything. So a few months ago I miscarried and this really made me no. emotional. So I just really wanted to thank you and to say that you literally were was well, is you are you are answer to my guys and i'm really thankful for having you here may allah bless you may thank you thank you sister for your question thank you to all of you for attending today's uh, session and big uh, may allah uh, subhanahu wa ta'ala allow that child to meet you at the gates of the jannah and to hold your hand into whatever gate of jannah that you please allahumma amin amin I mean, uh, for the for the end, it is a kind of Bosnian custom, okay. and the the way we do it here, when we have, uh, are are you going to throw something at me? Sorry, no, 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 no. <laughs> you know, the way you're introducing this custom is. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> we are on the same uh, frequency, okay. We are coming from the same school. School, we yes. said at the, at the back, right? Right. <laughs> yeah. <Absolutely>. Okay. <laughs> when we had. Uh, uh, have with us a good, uh, uh, good servant of God, like you, a man we are proud of. We usually ask him to read dua True. for us, and we following by saying, "Amen." So may I kindly ask you Inshallah. to read dua for all Muslims. Inshallah. All good people and we belong. Inshallah. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Hamdan Kathiram, Tayyiban, Mubarak, and Fee. Was Salat was Salamu ala Rasuli Hirim, or ala Anihi, was Sahmi Ajmain. Allah Makhril Mu'minina wal Mu'minat, wal Muslimina wal Muslimat. الأحياء منهم والأموات إنك سميع قريب مجيب الدعوات اللهم أصلح أحوال إخواننا المنكوبين في كل مكان آمين. اللهم أصلح أحوال إخواننا المنكوبين في كل مكان آمين. اللهم يا مقلب القلوب ثبت قلوبنا على دينك آمين. ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب ربنا إنك جامع الناس ليوم لا ريب فيه إن الله لا يخلف الميعاد ربنا لا تؤاخذنا إن نسينا أو أخطأنا ربنا ولا تحمل علينا إصرا كما حملته على الذين من قبلنا ربنا ولا تحملنا ما لا طاقة لنا به واعف عنا واغفر لنا وارحمنا أنت مولانا فانصرنا على القوم الكافرين وصل الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين والحمد لله رب العالمين